Hardy Weinberg principle in discussion and uh, comments made by Hardy, who was kind of mocking how trivial it was. But of course, non-trivial step was not kind of proving you know, this identity A plus B equals C, but turning the kind of question of, of kind of quasi-biological question of this formal genetics into mathematical questions. And the moment it happens, the rest kind of trivial. And this, of course, typical for application of mathematics to, to, to biology. I wouldn't, it's not quite so for physics, but definitely so for, for, for biology that non-trivial step is guessing the right mathematics. Once you guess it, I mean, it's solved. So you cannot ask what is important problem in biology, mathematical problem. If it is known, it's already solved. And the question is just to how to, how to formalize what we see. And the impression you have that there are many things which can be formalized as good as we know can be formalized from the cl classical, classical genetics or say statistical mechanics, entropy, where it has been done, but it's not done. And, and it's not kind of sophisticated, kind of mathematics sophisticated in the sense that it needs kind of well-balanced structure, like for conformal field theory, it works because there are kind of incredibly balanced mathematical structures. But essentially because there was a way to express what you want to say. And the kind of classical example of Boltzmann, who was kind of presenting his vision of, uh, of gases, statistical mechanics, and mathematicians were critical of him because the language of that time, conceptually, was not ad adequate to say what he was saying. And they were translating to the awkward 19th century language was nonsense. But not because he was saying nonsense, because the level of understanding of mathematics was very primitive. 19th century is, you know, it was the multiplication table mathematics, as Hardy says, and it remained essentially multiplication uh, table mathematics till the mid of the 20th century. And then there was this change due to coming from category theory, growth index, and then non-standard analysis, and general mathematics changes ways. But it doesn't mean we know answers. Yeah? It just only teaches us being humble. If we cannot formulate something properly mathematically, it means we are stupid, not because the nature kind of doesn't, doesn't say the right things. Right? And uh, so we say, if you were considering Boltzmann, but I think there is quite interesting mathematical question, which is unsolved. It's not even hard to formulate it, and just I don't know how much we all know what is Boltzmann equation. This is kind of a much easier problem than the one we will, will discuss in, 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 in biology, but it's already unsolved. You see, it is almost purely, almost mathematical. So, what it is. Yeah. And uh, some Applied mathematics, we write some kind of integral. Pam, 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 pum, 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 Instead, this equation. It's nonsense, of course. Huh? It's just sheer nonsense, 19th century way to express what Boyce was trying to say in this language. But in 21st century language, it's something else, and we don't know what it is. Right? So, intuitively, very simply, as, 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 as Boyce one says, we have randomly moving particles. So, they collide, and they collide according to certain law. We give this law. And then we make conjecture that they were on the collision, they are as independent as they were before the collision, which is never, apparently never satisfied in, in naive terms. And so equation might be nonsensical. However, this can be encoded and written in the formulas. But of course, you, the way I said it, I already said it. And everything is there, except we don't have now mathematical precise language to express it, except writing stupid formulas. And then people working on these formulas, and they be believe this is subject matter. It's not. Because the, 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 the essential feature in these vague statements is functorial. What I say, unspecific, applies to everything. And therefore, it means it's a functor between two categories. It's not equation. And then we specialize it to some very special case and think you make rigorous mathematics, which is nonsensical. Or it applies to physics. It's also nonsensical. Of course, it's rigorous in a way. I mean, it's formulated. But it's kind of wrong mathematics. Whether it applies all this conversion theory and people proven the subject converges here or there, if they have any relevance to physics, is questionable. Because they unconsciously you assume that real numbers are real. But real numbers are not real. They're real. They're not in the real world. There is no real numbers. Yeah? 
you know, word is governed by something else. People believed in the 19th century in the great minds like Maxwell actually saying explicitly, saying that physics, mathematics is about real numbers. It's not true. I mean, there is no reason to believe it is true. Yeah? We know very much nowadays it's certainly not true. Yeah? At least there is no reason to believe it being true, put it this way. There are all, all reason to expect it's not. And therefore, all these kind of, kind of ways for computing certain cases, this logic is OK. But for understanding anything, is kind of not. And so one simple question, this is a very simple question. What is the correctly, correct functorial definition of Boltzmann equation between which category is a function? Right? And this is true about very many physical equations, statistical mechanics. They are functions in certain categories which are specified, and this creates this tremendous mess. You write these meaningless formulas. Well, they meaningless, I mean, in a way, if you know notations. Yeah. The, the hardest part to understand notation. The, the, the essence is in, in this sentence. Like I said, if you say voice sentence that entropy is the number, the log of the number of states. And I think today's translation is. Entropy is element of growth in the group of such and such category, which happens to be a number by the law of knowledge numbers. And that's a number. It's not how you translate it. But you don't translate it by the formula. Right. This is a formula by Boisman. It's not definition. It's a oh, very convenient computational formula, without which this notion will be not useful. This is why you can compute it. But certainly, it's by no means a definition. Right? The same, this particular, there are particular formulas for specific Boltzmann equation, also a specific kind of entropy. So what I said, this idea of Boltzmann is very general, log of the number of states. Then you have to interpret what it means. And, and the reason mathematics, I'd say in, in some cases, I'm saying it's just log of the element of some growth in the group. And, and then you can see, it corresponds to what he says, much better than this formula. Right? Because when people say, ah, why this corresponds to that? And then this making, pretend they explain. They don't explain, right? Because you cannot explain, because it's not right. It's not entropy. It's a special computational formula for special case of that. And it has deep meaning, actually. It's not exactly what Boltzmann wrote, because in, in his formula was Boltzmann constant. And that was the whole point of this. This constant was delaying kind of macroscopic and microscopic world. And this was not the real part of the formula, not the stupid PIs, yeah? which is, oh, well, usually in, in, in physics, you write integral, yeah? and integrate dx. But that's minor variation. Yeah? But again, the point is, it's not that. Also, there is some k. And this k, it's like in, in quantum mechanics, h doesn't go to 0. h is a specific number. And this, by the way, will be even more pronounced when you go to biology. Things are not asymptotic. Interesting phenomena happens in a particular range of parameters. OK, so this is just indicate your instance of a mathematics which you kind of almost understand, yes. If you work hard, I mean, this can be settled, yeah. You can make pure, pure good formalism for Boltzmann and other equations, you know, in statistical mechanics, which has not been done. As you say, I spoke to many people, it has, apparently it has not been done. Everybody can believe this way. If you talk to a physicist, of course, this is how they think. And then they write these formulas because they don't know, they don't know what, to do, what else to do. And it's kind of, uh, so my own experience with that was when I was quite young and I was kind of was looking at some, some reason literature about Boltzmann equation. And there were hundreds of papers. Yes, obviously there was this function. People were substituting particular values. And this was the meaning they were writing absolutely the same argument, paper after paper, hundreds of papers. Boltzmann equation for different kind of situations. Yeah. And in fact, I mean, like computing without having, of course, a simple definition that would be just one line instead of hundreds of hundred page papers. Yeah. This is, but this is not, not, has not been done. So mathematics we need at this point is not kind of beautiful, elegant, symmetric mathematics, but just to understand, to translate the simple things to simple language, like non-standard analysis, right? Yes, you have infinitesimals, and you have to be sure you can speak about them freely. Or you have this natural object, you say naturality means functoriality. And again, you have fantastically simple language, and things become rigorous. OK, but this is a kind of preamble. And now we will turn to the matter at hand. And so let me see what happens here. This we have to eliminate. So we want to think about biological systems, particularly symmetry in biology, and just start with 
crystals, which are not quite uh, physical objects. And this is a little thing, just for your information. And, and this is proteins. So just below, you see some, I think it's myoglobin. It's just more or less how it looks. Of course, it doesn't look that nice, yeah? There is no picture of that. So it's made out of, of each, each ball is amino acid is size of about a nanometer or half a nanometer. So a small thing, and they, they're not balls. So what you, the best you can see is a, with X-ray crystallography, which in fact, highly sophisticated mathematical, mathematical uh, thing, you can see distribution electron density in space. So you have a kind of with, with certain error. And then you make these pictures. And by the way, making these pictures, the, 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 it is a non-trivial task. Right. To going through this, because if you look at the protein database and you see coordinates or some, some point there, out of this coordinates making a picture is highly non-trivial. And I will come to that. It's one of the problems about protein, how to describe protein. You know everything, but then you want to see it in a way you can say something interesting. And upstairs you have different crystals of proteins. How them thing may crystallize? Yeah. So this is just a little for your information. You see, when you have this kind of information, it's useless to say. Yeah, you just you, know, you look at this, you don't suppose to remember this, but just to have idea what objects are angstrom. Yeah, it's it's, it's one tenth of a nanometer, nanometer. Yeah, it's explain what it is. And this, of course, these scales are crucial in biology. Everything happens on a certain scale. In physics, of course, it's also so. But you kind of this constant looks more flexible. And here. I think we live in some range of constants, change them a little bit, and you are dead. I mean, there will be no life. This is another kind of remarkable thing. We can exist only in a very narrow kind of bracket of parameters, at least most of us. There are bacteria who are more, more not, not quite bacteria, archaea, who, who are more. Yeah. Now, this is a few words about uh, X ray crystallography. So, you have a crystal. So, how you can understand a complicated particle? You have a particle. It by itself, it's just it's divisible. There's no way to see it. However, if they're arranged systematically, periodically, then this periodic structure carries all information about this particle. If you average various characteristics on this crystal, these averages carry information about each individual particle. Again, this is mathematically interesting statement. So what you can see kind of by looking at many particles simultaneously, how much you can know about them individually, how well they should be organized. If they're not, if they're kind of chaotic, just in a gas, it's not so clear what you can do. This, by the way, another mathematically interesting question which you have to, you have to formulate, how much you can learn about individu individuals from the bulk, bulk information of the bulk and matter. You have kind of water, you will do something with this, and what you can say about atoms. You heat it, you see how it heats. For example, as you know, it's about water. It has this remarkable property that water is <coughs> liquid at very low temperature. So very low because so H2O at the normal pressure. So up to 100 centigrade, it's liquid. And molecular weight of this is 14, right? I'm sorry, H. If you take something like CO2, which is 12 plus 32, which is uh, by far heavier, it's in the normal room temperature, it's a gas. How could it be? If you take almost all kind of materials, yeah, comparable to, to this, yeah, to the water, there will be gases at normal temperature. Right? Just take, I don't know, nitrogen, yeah, oxygen itself, O2, yeah, it's certainly heavier than H2O. How, how could it be? Why water? Liquid. And it, so it's a very peculiar substance, and nobody, by the way, truly understands it. I mean, you know, lots of course understood, I would say, yeah. However, the structure of liquid water is a fantastically complicated Okay, it's fantastically complicated, and there is no good way to describe it. Again, physics described in metaphoric language, and then the microcomputational models. But there is no mathematics able to say, so what happens? Even, even if, if we knew it, we don't know how to say it. 
So, but that's immediately you see, so peculiar about water. And this, so of course, peculiarity is essential for life, by the way, if not for that. And this, of course, a mathematical phenomena, some about Schrodinger equations for these molecules. Molecules are uh, polarized in a particular way. And, if, and it's a result of, of probably, probably, nobody can prove it, of course. It follows from classical simple Schrodinger equation. But uh, what, uh, and for some numerology, you change a little bit. Parameters of atoms wouldn't be there. And we won't be here either. OK. So, so this about mm, uh, crystal. Uh, so what, uh, in, in a way, what X crystallography is, which I well, not, not myself don't understand 100%, it gives you Fourier transform of this. So we have this uh, density distribution in the crystal, electron density distribution in the crystal. And you take Fourier transform of that and take absolute value of that. Right, so it's three-dimensional Fourier transform, but not it, but it is only, only its amplitude. You cannot measure the phase. And exactly why you have all frequencies, I'm not quite understand. You must say I haven't thought carefully, because it's some kind of physics, which I haven't thought carefully. In, in, in any way, a reconstruction of the image, say the shape of a molecule, from its, from its um, this image in the crystal, uh, X-ray image, is highly non-trivial mathematical question. It was a really big success in, in the early 50s when people managed to, to do it, yeah? And uh, it was, in particular, say, for DNA, yeah? So people usually remember, you know, Crick and Watson, but the non-trivial work, in a way, much harder work, I think, was done by Wilkins and Rosaline, if I keep forgetting her name, who, who, who they are not so much mentioned. They made them up the bulk of the job, and then it was just... Yes, kind of children, children game, but Crick and Watson to reconstruct DNA because they already basic elements of that were dis uh, discovered by, by this mathematical analysis of very poor at that time X-ray X-ray images of DNA. What's his name? Uh, Nadia Rosaline. Uh, huh? Yes, right, exactly. It's controversial who 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 done the abort, but that's usually. Forgotten that the, this was really highly non-trivial, non-trivial stuff. But again, but so what I would mathematical question I want to bring in and just to see this is easy kind of stuff. How crystal may come about? So, so what a crystal? What are mathematically? What are crystals? Yeah? And uh, in, in the simplest kind of perception, and this is your kind of seeing the crystallography accounts. It's a pattern invariant under some group which contain group of this, and it's slightly bigger group, crystallography group, where this is a subgroup of finite index. And well, this was actually, interestingly enough, problem raised by Hilbert. So namely, that if you have a group gamma, discrete group gamma acting on Euclidean space or any other dimension, and there is discrete group of isometries, which is called, the quotient is compact. Then this gamma contains this lattice from which it follows, and this was actually the formulation of Hilbert, from which it follows there are only finitely many topological types of such actions, about 200 in dimension 3. And so what interestingly what Hilbert makes remark, this is kind of typical of many of his problems, he says, well, that's kind of remarkably, remarkably difficult problem. But if you look at the hyperbolic case, it's very easy to classify the groups because you know there are infinitely many topological types and the question is closed. <laughs> yeah, now, this was solved by Biberbach and this kindergarten problem. Yeah, I mean, just already everything was ready by that time. It's just exercise. Yeah. Show that the, this group is sitting there. I mean, because they, they were already kind of tools doing that. I mean, and, and it's, it's quite easy. I mean, it's just several line proofs. And this, of course, is still goes on and on and on. And you go forever. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, but our question is, it is extremely naive picture of a crystal. Yeah? It, it doesn't it just tell you something, but it's just the first word of that. What will be the second? One of them is how, in principle, crystal can be formed. So you have this kind of strange shape. So if you have a 
a molecule highly symmetric one, and they can arrange themselves in a crystal, you may be not so much surprised. But if you have this, that's like myoglobin molecule, which was one of the first to be crystallized, like here, yeah, this one. How you can make crystal? How such thing may, may organize themselves in something so well organized, shape themselves? It looks highly improbable, right? You have this potato type shape, you put them into a basket, you know, shake them, and you have a crystal. Have you ever seen that? Does it happen? Why the hell it happens? Huh? And the point, one of the points is, is that they all are the same. All these kind of protein particles are well, roughly the same. If they would be somewhat different, probably you wouldn't have crystals. For example, have five, say five kinds of particles. It would be different kind of a different kind of world of, of structures they would organize. The point is that you may have this, all particles being the same. Actually, the sameness is another characteristic, not obvious feature of biology. It's where symmetry begins before crystals appears. Because you have on one hand quite complicated object. Yeah, it's highly organized. It's not at all kind of it's random, random shape of particular type. Again, in nature you don't see that. In non-alive nature, if you look at snowflakes. Snowflakes also kind of have particular nice shapes. Look at them. They're very symmetric. But there is no two equal, identical snowflakes in the world, for all we know. Right? If you count the number of possible shapes, it goes into, by far, exceeds the number of non possible number of snowflakes. Well, probably. Right? And they form by some, uh, some mechanism and symmetry come from in intrinsic symmetry of the atoms. But here, symmetry comes from completely different reason. There is no absolute in the symmetry. This is a big shape. And uh, when you make such a crystal, there's a lot of water there. So it's kind of very watery. And, uh, and so what make it? However, it is mathematically is not impossible. Right? So just now I want to say that mathematically it's not impossible. And uh, just let's just a few remarks on how symmetry comes about from nothing. Yeah. Well, not from nothing, but from the things which things are all the same. So the fact they're all the same again, yes, it has some mathematics, mathematical issue behind it. But, uh, but the, the first level is quite simple. If you have one dimensional pattern, and you probably all heard this DNA helix, it makes a helix, and you may wonder why helix. But on the other hand, it cannot be anything by helix, yeah, because any one dimensional structure made of more or less identical blocks will be by necessity be helical. So, so you make the blocks, this is invisible, of course, there is nothing helical there, but why it should be helical? The corresponding mathematical statement is that if we have a cyclic group Z isometrically acting on the Euclidean space, the typical orbit here follows this helix. Of course, you may have parallel translate, or you may have rotation. But these are kind of two degenerate cases. Typical thing, you move and rotate. And any isometry is like that. And it's quite clear here, because if you imagine that this contact takes place, which minimizes the energy, which is simplification, but quite reasonable one. So these always preferred points of contact. And then this contact will be again the same. So you attach one on the top of another. And then one will be slightly turned with respect to another. So it means you have exactly this isometry. And so you have this helical symmetry. So anything one dimensional has helical symmetry. What's remarkable of DNA is not helical symmetry, which is kind of trivial con consequence of, 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 yes, of, of general principle of symmetry of the space, but it's one dimensionality. So, and it's kind of suppressed because it's assumed. Right? That's one of the so, problems also. The DNA is one dimensional. And that's a fundamental kind of property of life, that life starts with dimension one. And nobody can imagine starting with dimension two. Also, membranes, I will discuss about them. And kind of 3D system, well-organized crystals are, are typical for, 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 for living organisms. They're very rare in, in, in crystals inside of your protein crystals. But, but, mm, 1G structures are everywhere, and 2G also. Yeah. It's symmetric, 1G and 2G structures. 
And uh, once one dimensional, it's, uh, again, if just think about that, you will take you very far. The why it can be two, three, four, why things become very different when dimension grows. You cannot make anything with high dimensions. But that's one simple thing. So the helical system, symmetry for that reason is persistent in, in biology. Just, but there are one dimensional structures, throw molecules, they, they touch it up, they just laugh to become helical. I mean, just, if they're non helical, there will be good reason not to be helical. Okay? Everything is helical. And, uh, and, but then still how, but how you may have uh, crystal 3D. This, by the way, another interesting point, kind of conceptual, not very mathematical, that the way you, the major way to study proteins which live in your cells, to do something to them, they don't do themselves typically, they don't crystallize, yeah? In your cells, proteins, I think maybe in your eyes there is some, is it in crystal, crystalline form? If crystalline is a crystal, Nadia? Crystalline in your eye, is it crystal or not? As a protein. Crystalline in your eye is some particular protein from which your crystalline is made. Is it crystal or not? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, it's, yeah, I'm not sure either. But, but in any case, maybe with a few exceptions, there is no crystal in nature, or protein crystals. However, there's a major way to understand uh, proteins and in biology is kind of the, one of the major means of making crystals. And that's kind of an interesting point that you just you understand nature not by looking at what it does, but what it doesn't do. Right? Otherwise, you, you would be nowhere. Like, otherwise, you would be like, like, a, like an ape. Yeah? You see what you see, that's, that, that's it. But the whole thing you do and see what is not seen and do what is not normally done. Right? That's, that's a conflict between common sense and science. Science is just exactly opposite to common sense. Interestingly enough, again, it was very, its, its point of view is very by coming from the 20th century. So in 19th century, somebody like Thompson, Kelvin Thompson, who was certainly a great physicist and mathematician, was emphasizing that mathematics is nothing but extension of common sense. And from our point of view, of, of course, there's nothing, nothing to do. Exactly. When, when mathematics starts, common, common sense dies because common sense is just nonsense. But it was not mentality of 19th century. This is it's very interesting how much it has changed. Right? Yeah. No, our common sense is very, very unreliable, and exactly because there was revolution in physics. You know, quantum mechanics came completely showing you all your common sense is just nonsense. Everything you say just naively is wrong, period, and therefore you don't trust anymore. In, in a very sophisticated level of physics, not to say about common life, I mean, certainly everybody knows nonsense anyway. So, but that's now how, how but still with this, just if you use a little bit of common sense mathematics, you can realize why it's not impossible still to have crystals. But it's not impossible, but it's quite an interesting mathematical question, which has not been, in my view, properly studied. So imagine, so you have these particles and they have some interaction. Law and they want, they have a tendency to, 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 to take minima or at least critical points. Why they will be symmetric? And that is not so, uh, 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 even if these are completely, completely of wrong shape. Still, you know, the symmetry group operating. They're all the same. Imagine you want to put them on some lattice. And then the picture, here is a very simple picture again, which has not been, in my view, properly studied. You have infinite dimensional space. You have a group gamma acting on the space. You have a function invariant under the action. And then critical points just love to be fixed under this group. Right? It's amazing, but if you have a, say, some group acting, and you have some mi minimum point, and it's very likely to be the fixed point of the section. And moreover, if it happens, it will be stable. Right? If non-degenerate, say, maximum point, and there is a fixed point, there is a group acting, it will be stable. And this is a little kind of very simple mathematics. It shows it happens. Therefore, these crystals are not impossible. They're not so improbable. Once they're there, of course, if some, some parameter must be. Must be match each other a little bit, and then we'll have stable fixed points, stable critical points, stable and, and will be symmetric. However, again, in my view, there was a theory of Morse theory, equivalent, ta, 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 but it never approached this question. Yeah. It was going along the lines about more, much more simple questions. This is more, more, more complicated yeah, to understand it because group is not compact, and there are a few groups acting here. This group gamma, and this group observed, this group not canonical 
in the Euclidean space up to linear transformation. So there is a parameter in the group. So it's one, not one group gamma, but, uh, but so in, in R3, six parametric family, right? Because you can, the basis of the group, you can change. And if you look at the modular space, it will be this radical so sophisticated symmetric space, five dimensional locally symmetric space. It's just this space of all matrix, modular gamma. So it's quite remarkable, kind of five dimensional manifold with singularity, orbifold, uh, locally symmetric space, which underlies the picture of these crystals, or biological crystals. Nobody look at this. I mean, it's, it's amazingly, right? It's, you can purely for, can make, you can make, purely mathematical theory up to some point, which has not been done, so. And again, I guess it's not my intention. It would, it would take, of course, a certain time to develop it and a long time to explain it. But it's clear it's it there. However, it's only, only, again, still kind of trivial kind of thing because you see it, yeah. And now it's just mathematics. Once at this point, it just, well, not quite trivial, but still just in mathematics. On the other hand, there are more, much more about crystals. That's exactly the, the advantage you get making point outside of mathematics. You start seeing what you don't see from inside. And what you see, crystals are not just God given to you. The crystal grow. What is crystal growth mathematically? Again, physicists have this or that model, but we don't have a definition mathematically. What does it mean to have a crystal grow? And so what is abstract mathematical description of, of, of crystal growing? And the crystals are not infinite thing, they're finite, and they have, you know, defects, etc., etc. There is no mathematical language to describe it. Again, the, this is a language for, for, for people in applied math, but they emphasize examples. There is no general principles. OK, this I just want to. This all my lecture will be propaganda of questions we don't know how to solve. Because each of them will be a certain theory, and this theory will be quite interesting. OK, what is this? Stack. Yeah. yeah, this is some talk about symmetries. So I want to now to turn to something else. Yeah, it's nine parameters, not six, yeah, of course. It's a linear group. Here's a nine parametric. So well, typical m m question is, yeah, a specific mathematical question in, in what I'm saying would be, so imagine I have a mixture of two types of particles. Still, crystals are possible. So how it depends on the proportion and, and relative size, probability of The probability meaning in the parameter space of them that they form a sufficiently, a sufficiently robust crystal. So you have kind of huge, huge variety of questions. By the way, this is the, the following interesting phenomenon which is not related to crystal, but may have some role here. If you take p p some powder of some kind, and it just says powder, and then take another powder and little powder. But imagine the particles are very different size. If you mix them together, it looks like uh, a dough, like almost fluid. Right. And this is, but I don't think there is, again, a mathematical description of that. It's a very long phenomenon. You mix two powders of a different size, and it becomes one kind of serve as a liquid with respect to another. And the whole thing looks like uh, rather viscous, but fluid, which is systematically used in people in, in oil industry when they put the water into the, there and just to, to make things fluid. Sometimes it, it makes it's more fluid, you add more powder, and it becomes more fluid. So, and the same may be true about, about uh, protein with many particles. If you have Particles of different sizes may completely have completely different mathematics, and the crystal will be of completely different type. A priori, from what I said, it still may be crystal. It still would have some symmetry, but it may be symmetry of somewhat different type. Okay. Well, it just very naively, of course, crystal of anything. It's naive, but not terribly naive. It is local minimum, at least local, and sometimes global minimum of certain energy function in, of interaction between these particles, right? So you're saying in, in, its, uh, in its, uh, um, translation, I'm sorry, in its form, 
Yeah. No, no, of course, they're active. They don't have to be crystallized in order to be active. But in, 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 when they fold and you can form a crystal, you learn immediately very many things by that. First, you learn they're all more or less of the same shape. So you know from the existence of crystals, you conclude that all protein molecules of a given type are roughly of the same shape. And it's an extremely strong conclusion, by the way, yeah? because you don't see these particles. These particles are the a few nanometers. You can be seen. Microscopically, and crystals were observed a long time ago. I think. I think crystals of hemoglobin were known, or myoglobin were known for, for, for several, almost more than 200, about 150 years. Yeah. So just looking at that, you know, whatever substance it is, it must consist of identical particles, right? Which is because if they are all different, uh, I think crystals are impossible. If they really have very heterogeneous collection of particles, there would be no crystal. But their activity has nothing to do with crystallization. B the both their activity and crystallization depends on the fact that there is preferred shape and it's taken by most of the particles. That's true. But this, so this is fact. And this is a highly non-trivial fact about, about life, that microscopic, as much as microscopic particles, very often go in series being almost identical. Like all human beings more or less identical. Like it's amazingly, I have billions of them all the same. How could be? Right? It would never so for, for, for natural objects. Yeah, I have stones, they have much more variety than a human being, given so many parameters, of course. In this parameter space, we're highly localized. And already that starts from proteins and, and two properties. Both is biological function depends on that, and that's ability, our ability to understand them. But the crystallizing, of course, is a very tricky matter. And this is where a mathematician may be useful, because crystallizing protein is a highly, highly non-trivial. It's an art, which means people don't understand how it works. But art means I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Now, about membranes. So these were kind of three-dimensional structures. They mathematically we kind of approach them. But before we turn to protein structure, I want to look at membrane where, in fact, mathematically, you can say more than the father's one. Yeah? Yes. Well, yes, if you have a more or less identical particle of any kind, in, even viruses, yeah, quite big particles, in principle, you can crystallize them. So you can make a range. In principle, meaning you usually add some substance, particular temperature, ta, 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 but then there exists, at least metastably, some local minimum of configuration of them which will be periodic. And this is, of course, not known for all, but there are proteins which you can crystallize for good reason, and they have no definite shape. But lots of, of, of things can be crystallized, including, including DNA yeah, segments. Yeah. Big, I think, piece of DNA will have random shapes, so you cannot crystallize it. But again, I must say, I'm saying that I don't truly understand it, because first, I don't know enough uh, uh, crystallography or, 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 or in biology and, and mathematically, I think it's unknown. This I also don't know, but this I know nobody knows. About the rest, possibly some people know better, but I'm not that certain. Yeah, the systematic, well, st structural knowledge of the nature of cr cr crystallization. It's very just how entropically it happens, and uh, it is not at all, not at all clear. And again, there is no mathematical study of that. So, in, and, and from from our point of view, if there has not been studied by a mathematician of post growth ending time, things don't exist, right? So, things exist for mathematician if they were pre presented by post growth ending style of mathematics. If, even if mathematics outside of this field, I think that exists. It's just pre mathematical just pre precursor of true mathematics. And the, most of mathematics, of course, of this kind. And most of the science of this type is precursor to real things. Of course, when, when we go, this post growth and will be also old fashioned, but, but anything which is, doesn't fit there looks like the, like rather, rather pathetic. Okay. And, 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 and unreliable, of course. So, but now I want to speak about membranes. And so, let me show you a picture. 
Jadi so, Adi Tresha ya. This is a erythrocyte blood red, red cell. And just for looking at this, I mean, just and thinking about this and learning it raises huge amount of mathematical problem and already seen structures. So, and just I, I saw what's mean many, many, many years ago. I, I, I attended some meeting about erythrocyte. What happens to them in the wrong condition? This shape is highly unstable. You put them into the glass, uh, into, a gla into a glass, and just whatever. In there, it immediately changes form, become completely chaotic, ir irregular form. Yeah, they, which is again never happens in nature, but was studied quite a bit. So the first question: Why this form? Yeah. So it's big and cave. This would be what emphasized by biologists: Why it's big and cave? But the question for mathematicians: Why it has axial symmetry. You see, it's not spherical symmetry. It is axial symmetry. Now, we are much more acquainted with spherical symmetry. And we all know of soap bubbles. And their soap bubbles are spherical. And then we say, ha, we even understand why they are spherical. Because they solve the isoperimetric problem. Yeah, and this I have little discussion with that. Historical, it's kind of interesting problem. So when it was first. Yeah. That's quite old. But somehow it was not influenced by erythrocytes. And for erythrocytes, we still don't know uh, so what happens. There is a similar problem, which for some reason was more famous. It's called Wilmore problem, which was recently solved about some another variation of problem. About uh, by extremal shape was also having only one symmetry. It was a torus. But for erythrocytes, for some reason, mathematicians never thought about it. Now, Biologists, at least it's by engineers with whom I communicated at some moment, they say, oh, we can prove, yeah, with this shape. Of course, my understanding what they can prove, assuming it's circularly symmetric, they can say that they have, say, say, it would have this form. Again, you have to explain in what sense, what variational problem being solved, yeah? and why. And uh, it's very similar to Wilmore problem, but in my view, unlike Wilmore problem, it is mathematically incomparably prof more profound and kind of opens perspectives where will more is just seems to me just little thing compared to that. And uh, this looks to me really pertains to very fundamental issues in mathematics, if you understand what happens here. So first, very naively, so what happens here? And the problem you can formulate is as follows, that the shape, so by the way, this also applies to soap bubble. We can say, ah, we prove, we prove soap bubble, indeed, me, me, me has minimal area per given volume. And we've proven this, and there are proofs, which, by the way, none of them truly satisfactory. All proofs are kind of not quite nice, eh? all non trivial, and well, they, none, I mean, there is no 100% understanding of that. And we hardly touch the problem because we see this is a not, the surface of a soap bubble is not like a ball or something. It's not that it doesn't want to stretch or whatever. Why it would minimize uh, area at all? Why it wants to minimize area of the boundary? We, we have to return to this. Uh, actually, the soap bubble very much similar to the other side. The, 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 the mathematics, physics, chemistry, whatever behind it's more or less the same. And it's not this naive plateau problem. This plateau problem is just from point of view of soap bubble, soap bubble, if you could laugh, you would laugh at mathematicians who said they understood it, yeah? Because they never touched, they scratched the surface of the depths of the problem, which is which in there. Yeah. Because how it's made, how this out of soap, yeah, it's nothing. How this thing can exist, right? You know, poop, and it may maybe that big, yeah, how can it be? I mean, it's, it's absolutely, again, this is a very naive uh, attitude. Uh, you solve this GDO uh, problem, of course, 2000, whatever, 3000, 4000 years ago when GDO were, it was okay. But we mathematicians still on the same level of understanding. And now we have a retrocyte. 
So what are the problem Eritrocyte solves? Right. But again, this will be superficial discussion, though it will be already go well beyond this naive isoperimetry. It is, this is what people say in, in bioengineering, and maybe it's right, maybe wrong. This is, of course, there is some kind of heuristic reasoning why it should be so, but I'm not certain there is good experimental evidence for that. It, per given volume it bounds, and given area, so two parameters are given, it minimizes integral of the squared curvature of the surface, which is almost like real more problem. I said that is slightly different. So, and, and then the basic, like for usual isoperimetric problem, the fundamental thing is that solution is spherically symmetric. You see, if you have linear problems, then typically, Symmetric data implies symmetric solutions, which is not quite so, which, even for linear equation. But kind of that's the principle, right? Especially if we have time developing linear equation, of course it develops on time, it goes, 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 and symmetry, on the gain in symmetry. Not only symmetry preserved, but only gain in symmetry, and at least this, the way, one, one way to. Mm, it's being manifested, it's the second law of thermodynamics. When people say all oh, these words for me at least about chaos, ta -ta -ta, about second law, it's nonsense. It's just symmetry which increases. Because you have kind of parabolic flow, and parabolic flow tends to make things more and more symmetric. Like the how universe, because it is dissipation on certain scale, which means it's kind of parabolic, it is dissipation, and symmetry grows, and this means what they call chaos. But in, in fact, become more and more homogeneous. Why is it called chaotic? I don't know. You can more machine right? And, and then, of course, the corresponding mathematical theorem has never been stated and certainly not proven, but that's how you want to understand second law. And again, as I say, it's, we have to continue the Boltzmann discussion and to, to bring it to mathematical le level of, of, of today. But, but, but here, it's not so. And again, the fundamental point, one kind of was emphasized by Turing, that certain slightly nonlinear equation, even when they're symmetric, partially symmetric, may bring non-symmetric solutions. For example, if you look at an at, at, at ocean and there is a space and everything is symmetric and there is a wind and it also has this symmetry, however, there are waves and waves break symmetry. Waves, right, they're not symmetric. They have symmetry, but that symmetry are with respect to discrete subgroups, not with respect to the full group. Another fun, f f f famous example, when you have a certain kind of liquid, I'm not certain how it exactly works, and you start warming it from here, and it goes up, and then become divided into hexagonal pattern, and there are kind of the whole thing, and it becomes symmetric here with respect to this hexagonal group, lattice and two, but it's not fully symmetric. When you have some non-symmetric thing, non-linear thing, the symmetry tends to break, though not completely, right? It, you, you, you break, for example, you have this pattern of zebra, which is in agreement with, with Turing equation. This has some little symmetry, but not the spatial symmetry. Right? But, but here's a different equation, the elliptic equations, the nonlinear elliptic equations. And typically, having symmetric solutions means that in some sense the corresponding functional is convex with respect to some structure compatible with the symmetry. But it's not kind of even for isoperimetric problem, you cannot prove it or formulate it in this way. It's not convex in a conceivable, simple way. It is, it in, a, in a some sense, it is, but again, by the way, there is no mathematics to say in what. So all proofs secret, secretly use something like convexity, but there is no, no, no good way to formulate it. We don't know how to say it. This, by the way, also true in, on a more modern, modern scale, what Perelman proven, the way he proven upon correct injection, other thing with, with Hamilton flow, it exactly this certain flow, and because it's flow, it symmetrizes things. And this, what the, major, the main point to prove, that it has enough time to symmetrize it before singularity develops. Yeah, it's, and again, secretly, there, there's some convexity built into the function of curvature, which is certainly not convex in any naive sense. And one of the issues to understand in what sense and where you gain in that, and that's, we, we shall come to this in a second, which is suggested by that. Now, 
so how you can bring this uh, uh, to make a next step? What will be kind of a mathematical extension of that? Right. So here we maximize, minimize given volume, given area. We, we minimize, we minimize uh, total total curvature properly measured, and volume of course is not belonging, not belonging to the surface. It's just uh, extra part. So even without volume, this kind of interesting question. And so what you may ask, so what, how much symmetry this kind of problem may, may su su survive? Yeah? So what will be general question of this type? How to formulate this question in, the, in, the, in, in general terms? And then, so you look in mathematics and ask where it happens. W when do you observe that certain some varieties, say in Euclidean space or somewhere else, not just minimize area, but minimize some integrals of their curvatures. Right? And uh, looking at this example, you may guess what, how to then uh, generalize this question. So this again, this is a purely mathematical question. I repeat, you can see the surface is in R3 with given area and given volume they bound, you want to minimize the integrated square curvature. Again, I shall later explain why this is plausible conjecture to say they do this in life, erythrocytes. And if they're spherically symmetric, I think you can prove they have this big concave form. This I think what people prove. I, I couldn't find this in, in, in references, but I spoke to people a very long time ago. So I'm forgetting, forgotten. It was kind of, kind of an interesting meeting. They were both doctors and bioengineers, and uh, it was very interesting listening to their conversation during lunch. Yeah. So they were discussing cases of, 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 of their patients, which were quite, quite, quite interesting. Yeah. Maybe I'll tell you later. And uh, so how to do it? And then you know what it is. The complex submanifolds of Kähler manifolds. For example, in CN, yeah. So if you have a CN complex space and you take anything defined, the hypersurface defined by analytic function, then not only it will be minimal, but it will minimize quite a few, it will minimize quite a few integrals of its curvatures. So what does it minimize? How to so first, why it minimize, why it minimize area? This, I think, is a major justification of concepts of minimal surfaces, exactly this example. This is a, because these objects are God given to you, and the fact that they all minimize volume is quite, quite remarkable, though extremely simple. And I remember when I first learned it, it was really shocked to me, and because it's not the first thing you have to see online or any kind of textbook on minimal varieties. This is why you care for them, yeah? So just see, see the simplest case would be something two-dimensional. So it's a complex one-dimensional, like C, sitting in C2. For example, maybe a graph of holomorphic function, right? Such a graph in C2, this will be minimal surface. Moreover, it's absolutely minimizing. If you per given boundary, it has minimal area, absolutely minimal for all, for all possible, for all possible surfaces. And the proof is extremely simple, because in the space C2, say C2, and this is in general, you have this differential form, this exterior form. And this form has a property. So this is very, very simple. Yeah, the way I describe it, it looks kind of, kind of tricky, but it is C2. It's projected to, in two ways to C. On each of them, you have area form here, area form. This is one area form coming here. Here is another area form. You take this sum. Right? So area of a little piece of a surface in this space is sum of this plus this. But of course, you keep track of signs. If you change it, you change the sign. And of course, if you, because these maps have positive degree, they're conformal, it's kind of obvious that if you have inside of C2 anything complex, and complex meaning it goes here and here by conformal map, then this form just equal to the area, right? 
So if you integrate this form over little pieces of complex things, it will be exactly area. But if you take anything which is not complex, it will be strictly less. Right? In some direction, just zero. Right? If you take this long diagonal between two, two planes, yeah, or any kind of real, uh, purely real, real, on the real, on the real path, it will be as zero. And so it goes from zero to the maximum value, maximum value in complex direction. And this kind of observation, I think, maybe by Federer, uh, amazingly, it was not done 100 years prior to that. Maybe it was, but I, I'm saying Federer, but I haven't checked the history. I will not surprise it was known to, to somebody like Monge. Well, no, if Monge knew complex analysis, of course. And therefore, the rest is quite clear because now this integral, what is the integral? What is this? You, you integrate this thing, it's your form against area. And because it's closed form, integral doesn't depend on uh, the surface. So it's always the same, right? So, so if you take any other surface, if you have some, uh, for any other surface, integral may, may be, because integral is always the same. So if area goes down, if you move it, I'm sorry, at every point, the form may become only smaller. So integral only can become only smaller. The only way to keep it the same area must become bigger. Point-wise, it becomes smaller. Therefore, in order to compensate, and in the integral give the same number, area must become bigger, right? If you integrate a smaller function and get the same result, meaning domain of integration must be bigger, right? Because it's kind of product. What is the integral? Product of area, roughly, of this by, by the value. The product is constant. One term goes down, another must go up. So area goes up. That's the argument. It's trivial. If the, the moment you believe in this algebraic property is called Wettinger inequality, that, that. So, and, but then, how you can go to high curvatures for algebraic case? And then there is a very simple thing. If you take that, you can produce new objects. You just take all tangent planes to this. And this just goes to high dimensional complex space. Then you can take tangent plane again, again, and again. And you again get complex objects in some Keller manifolds. And they're all minimal. But now the areas, if you, for example, if you take a curve, take all tangent, that will be kind of, it's, you're making tangent essentially like taking derivatives. So you integrate area of derivative. So you integrate second derivative. You do it two times with third derivative. So at each level, you integrate high and high expression of high and high derivatives. And they're all, and they're all minimal. And then you do this for, for smooth scale. This was motivation starting from this, from this uh, example of, of erythrocyte. You just see aha, what you have in mathematics, kind of vaguely similar. And then the, you, you come to the following variational problem. You take some manifold in Euclidean space, or any Riemannian manifold, take it all tangent direction. So it's both k-dimensional, say, and n-dimensional. So you take this, it will be Grassmannian of k-plane on your manifold x. This will be big manifold x. And this was some manifold y. And then this y lifts here to this Grassmannian. Take all tangent planes. Then keep doing it many times. These spaces have more or less canonical metrics. Each Grassmannian is homogeneous space has a metric. And if y is Riemannian, it has parallel transport. So there is metric. There is horizontal direction. There is, so there is some ambiguity. There is one parameter you have to adjust. So on each stage, there will be one parameter, which is probably very essential. So it will be, when you go on two levels, there will be two parameters. So it will be a combination of certain quantities, which are all integrals of higher derivatives. And then you ask, so what the, what the variational problem is? So what is what, what the solution to these problems? So, so abstract, and, and this will be the first level of that will be this problem here, with this original problem of erythrocyte when you go one step up. And uh, in particular, you ask if, so if, the, 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 if you go to the level k, you lose kind of k degrees of symmetry no more than that. So, so, so as much symmetry as you expect from counting parameters remains. And of course, we don't know that. And we don't know what will be the theory here. It will be very different from usual geometric measure theory because smooth structure involved in a more serious way. In the usual geometric measure theory, the point is you forget about smooth structure. You work with very singular objects. And the power of theory still can go through. Here, smoothness remains. On the other hand, when it's algebraic geometry, you may have singularities. It's OK. I mean, things go very smoothly even with singularities. So what happens here? So this is a. 
This looks to me quite interesting, quite interesting issue. However, however, this again is peanuts compared to the real problem. This is, of course, a difficult question. It's kind of something much harder, probably, if it can be done than geometric measure theory, which is already hard enough. But again, compared to the real thing, it's still kind of extremely naive. Because we have to look back and to, to this to this editor side and 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 so what makes it kind of or so bubble for this purpose and just look at this how it's made how why it manages to minimize this quantity and then it's in, in, and, and then it's kind of really in quite quite of course amusing because it is uh, uh, like that yeah so so this, this membrane of this yeah is not really kind of like that but it's built out of perpendicular normals. They are rod-like molecules, which are, let me see if I have this picture here, called bilipids, which don't stick to, together. They, they, they stick together not because they're sticky. They stick together because, for, for a purely probabilistic reason. Uh, no, no, it's already been proposed to viruses, okay. So I don't have this picture here. And, uh, so, so you have this kind of molecules, and they rod-like molecules, and they make this ta 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 ta. They make these membranes. Why they make these membranes? Essentially, I mean, of course, I'm again it's metaphoric, because this is the most probable state for them. They don't interact themselves. There is no force between two of them keeping them together. And in fact, you can see it in the erythrocyte. Actually, erythrocyte, all cells made this way, but in most cells, besides this, there are lots and lots of proteins sticking inside. In erythrocytes, there are very few proteins. They are most pure, pure this bilipid layer. And you can see, there is a microphotograph seeing how it moves. It is, this thing is two dimensional and liquid. They completely move freely, one with the pack to another. They keep this shape, but within themselves, it's two dimensional liquid. There is no forces, no stickiness between them. But what keeps them together is probability. Probability. It's most likely configuration in for certain measure. Right? There is certain measure in the space of such molecules. So, so that this configuration is most probable. Right? And the same, by the way, reason for so bubbles which we, we make in space. They take this shape because it's most probable shape. It's kind of amusing. Of course, you must be careful what is the measure. Right? And how this measure come, where the measure come from. <clears throat> and this measure is not only in the space of these molecules, but in the, the, in the water. If not for water, it wouldn't work. The water is called hydrophobic. And they have certain affinity for water, positive or negative. Yeah? So hydrophobicity, whatever. It is a, so water molecules are highly polarized. Yeah? So there is oxygen, there are these two hydrogens, and it kind of has this high polarization. And so there is electric interaction between different molecules and this kind of molecules and any other molecules, in particular those. And these are not polarized, so they don't like to have water, especially at the ends, yeah? Especially, and these are, these are bilipids, so, so here is a lipid ends, which don't want to be close to water. And so, they, yes, if you write down there, energy kind of Boltzmann function for that where one term is probability of course and another is interaction this tends to minimize it when this sit inside so they want to be hidden and this is the shape when this center become hidden right so of course energy is involved but not so much energy of interaction between the molecules but their interaction with water molecules and then from this probabilistic reason they exist and then this solution variation problem enters here However, it's still not that easy. And um, it's unclear what should be kind of proper mathematical theory. So what, of course, interesting is that so this differential equation, which eventually defines either so bubble, erythrocytes, whatever, come from this statistical ensemble. So I have a statistical ensemble of particles of two kinds, water and these particles. There is energy attached to it. And, of course, there is those entropy, meaning the phase volume when they leave. And from this, you write something, some kind of function in this space, 
which uh, the Boltzmann function, which kind of minimum of which corresponds to that, right? However, this always parameter is the temperature. If you, and again, this is how kind of non-mathematical non thinking gives you a new perspective. You heat it, which you don't do in mathematics with, with minimal surfaces, yeah? You, you, you know, we ask, right, mathematically, what does happen if you, he, 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 if you heat a plateau equation, right? I mean, but here it is, you have to heat it, whoop, everything disappears, right? They all decay, you know, life decay, and they go, you cool it down, and they still come, so they come back. And you don't have simple mathematical model for that. Absolutely. And this is quite remarkable because you may think, because this process of heating, whatever, this kind of, a, of course, kind of phase transition, but this is just words, yeah. What is, what, how much of the structure, for example, so bubble aspherical, and this has some symmetry. Can you see the symmetry in the high temperature? What happens when you heat it, it becomes real kind of randomly moving particles. Can you see symmetry there? In what sense? You know that after cooling, it will become symmetric. Because if you have a long parameter, it's an analytic function. So everything already there. All knowledge exists if you know high temperature. How you can read information what happens at low temperature? Again, these are metaphoric words, yeah? That's exactly the issue. How to make mathematic out of this? We know it is there. I mean, there's no question about it. And uh, I, I wonder if it's a universal thing for many geometric differential equations. So my, my kind of dream that all meaningful equation, I'm not any stupid equation, but really good, like Hodge equation, your minimal surface equation, whatever, they all of this nature. The only low temperature limits of something much more kind of interesting, and this interesting lives in a different world. But in this world, all the symmetry, all the properties are there if you know how to state them properly. And if you know them, you know much more about the original objects. They are just very degenerate representatives of some fundamental statistical law in some phase space. OK. So that's about membranes. But so we had one dimensional, we had crystal, we had membranes, and I want to talk about proteins. Ah, no, maybe about three dimensions, I say two words about viruses. Which again, we have another kind of variational problem, which we again have no mathematical formulation of. No. So let's look at the virus. It's not very apparent if you look at this virus. This is, I think, an electronic photograph. It's rather realistic. But you may be heard that many. Most viruses are highly symmetric. All small viruses have high icosahedral symmetry. So they have this icosahedral group acting on them, which was certainly they discovered. It's usually ascribed to Tay the Platonian body. Icosahedral was described by Tay Tet, but of course viruses were much longer here than Tay Tet. And most small viruses are icosahedral. There are bigger viruses which have these helical symmetries. Recently, I was alone. I, I, I people discovered viruses without symmetry. And there was a real shock. And they're huge viruses without symmetry. Nobody understood why. But, but if you first look at this, why the hell a virus must have icosahedral symmetry? No, we don't, people don't have it. And no other organism of moderate size have this kind of symmetry. Of course, there are five fold symmetry for the sea stars, yeah? Actually, I, I'm wondering if anybody can give a rational explanation why, why number five. Yeah? Two bilateral symmetry is kind of clear because of evolution. But when it's come to high symmetry, it's tricky. But he's icosahedral, so it's a group, you know, 60 or 120 elements. Yeah? And how, how it can be? Why this symmetry? And this is no cubical virus, for all I know. So why icosahedral? What, again, they do solve some variational problem, but very, of, of very different kind. And that's, again, this is a little bit speculative, but interestingly enough, this was predicted before they actually was determined and by Watson, the same Watson, who was Crick and Watson. On the basis of data, they had crystallographic data and some speculation, uh, they, they, which I, I'm going to explain, they arrived at the idea of icosahedral symmetry for viruses. And 
the reasons, reasonings, creative reasoning, it would be quite interesting to, to make it mathematical. I mean, it's, it's kind of mathematical, but speculative again. We don't have enough, enough um, means to say it exactly. So part of the reason is the same as for usual crystals. So we have a virus made out of some proteins, a particle, and this particle uh, inside there is DNA. But if you look at the virus code, it's just made out of proteins. And many other things go into there, but basically they're proteins. And they make this code of a virus, and they assemble, and having symmetry is no more surprising than having symmetry of a crystal. It's slightly more surprising because you have to go around and exactly make fit. Yeah? So this is one parameter you have to adjust. But it's not impossible. Yeah? It's not completely. So you see, if you have 100 parameters to adjust, it would be absolutely improbable to develop such system evolution. No evolution is too much. Yeah? You have fine fitting of 100 parameters. But here it's about 100. The group has 60. The group has 60. Think, yeah. So how, uh, so how you can do that? It's not one cyclic group, yeah? But a tricky, simple group. And then the reasoning, I think, suggested by Crick and Watson is as follows. What is the problem? What is the variational problem virus solves? The point is, it does solve some variational problem. It minimizes something. Of course, he wants to minimize the size of its code. But what it must contain inside? You see, it's not a volume like a cell. Which a cell contains a molecule. It wants to have maximal volume inside if it cares. But what virus contains? What it contains inside is its DNA, RNA, depending on what kind of virus it is. Right. The whole purpose of this code is to protect and prepare this DNA for, for, from, for you know, eventually it must enter somebody's cell and infect you. So the, and the purpose of the code contains as much DNA as possible in order for this DNA to be most efficient to doing what it's supposed to do. And, and this viral code is coded by this DNA. So we have this very mathematically very interesting kind of coupling. We have a surface which must engross, contain something, and this something encodes the structure of the surface. Right? Encodes. So relation is extremely tricky. Physically, mathematically, very hard to say what it is. Yeah? And then it's kind of intuitively clear that symmetric patterns are optimal. Because Symmetric pattern can be done of, of identical particle of proteins. And it's much easier to encode one particle than many, even if this particle must be of special kind. Because in, in material, you have the same size of genes encoding any protein, whether it has this shape or that shape. So if you, therefore, a relatively short gene can encode protein such that it will mesh itself such that they make the face of icosahedron. Yeah? So it has this internal symmetry like triangle, and then they make icosahedron because of the symmetry. And this is the optimal way to do it. It should be noted, by the way, that uh, bases in, in DNA are much heavier than, than amino acids. Yeah? So what usually you think information is kind of physically lighter, simpler than what you, you make. right? You, you have instruction to make some object, and it's written on thin paper, and then you make big objects. In biology, it's opposite. You have this big stuff, information, and then after this, you make something 10 times the thing smaller. right? Each piece, so the amount of information, the weight in DNA, you know, to, to make one uh, of protein, I think DNA is three or ten times heavier than, than uh, protein it's encodes. At least ten times, maybe more than that, I've forgotten it. But it's much bigger, yeah? it's kind of paradoxical somewhat. But so it is. So it's a, it's a huge thing, yeah, inside. This information is very expensive. It costs you oh, a lot, yeah, it's very heavy. Each extra information to encode second such molecule would be ah, in enormous, enormous enlargement. And therefore, why should do that? Okay, the question is how to formulate mathematically. It's certainly a purely mathematical phenomenon uh, expressed in, in this language, but we don't know how to, how, well, you say it's simple words. Of course, you can make specific models, ta -ta 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 -ta, it will be bore. Clearly, it's something very general. So the question is what it is. Right? So it's again, I think very, very amusing issue. And, uh, and then, of course, there will be other mathematical questions. I haven't thought about that. Imagine once you have general mathematical question, more or less the way I stated here, you can push it very far and look at, at other examples. And, and, and then a symmetry group emerge from that level. Right? Can you imagine such model 
explaining symmetry of the physical world. Hmm? By the way, we see in biology we see that the, this reason of some of the symmetries come, you make symmetric thing because it's kind of the easiest thing to do, in a way. And the easiest, and very, here it's very specific sense, because information has been encoded, ta -da -da, it's just easiest, it's not uh, emotional, but it's really some process, it's uh, the, uh, in a very technical sense, probably the simplest. I, I'm curious if it's possible to give such a model. Actually, people were trying to do that. I remember somebody was trying to do this uh, for, for explaining gravity. Uh, gravity has this nature. It's a kind of information type phenomenon. Well, people don't accept it, of course, but, but there, 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 is such, there is such a mo model now of gravity. But anyway, this logically is clearly suggestive. OK, so it's another example of, of mathematics coming from biology. You see, just, I, just about two years ago, I was trying to write an article about that and try to formulate these questions and just to make at least one step for describing them. And, but then they realized it would take me several years. I, I had to write some article first, and so I wrote only a third of my introduction, and this is what I was talking to you about entropy, the part which you can go and more or less to make steps in, inside of mathematics. But a lot of this I found extremely slow process uh, to, to, to doing that. You see, it's, in a way it's harder then it, it, in a way, it's harder, in a way, it's easier than, than, than doing, doing mathematics per se. Actually, I was thinking about the following, by the way, examples. So what is hard and what is easy in mathematics or not? So one fact is that nowadays we have reasonably good programs which even can prove difficult, rather difficult theorems. <coughs> On the other hand, there is no hint of a program which can formulate this kind of uh, the kind of program can formulate problem of this type, translate something simple into 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 mathematics. So let me give a very simple example, much easier than what I'm saying when we perfectly know how, what to do. Like what Hardy, when he was formulating this problem of Mendelian dynamics, Mendelian genetics into mathematics, he had he didn't have to think. But just his mathematical instinct immediately told him what would be the mathematical shape of the question. And he even didn't notice it, that he was doing something. Right? He tra translated this naive thing, you have population, random mating, pa pa pa, there is this formula. Right? They multiply. It was so obvious for him, not even obvious, he didn't have to say obvious. It was like breathing. You don't say it's obvious how you breathe, yeah, you just, just breathe. And, but then, even this mathematical computation he had to make, it was multiplication table, but he had to make conscious effort to make it. Right? On the other hand, if you try to formalize it, it's opposite. You can easily make any kind of simplify any formula on the computer, but this first step, absolutely, we don't know how it works. No, it's automatic in our brain. It's not, we don't know what this, what this mechanism. It's a very simple mechanism, but we are not aware of it because it's never conscious. Right? So let me give an example, a very, very, very simple example of that, which is, I think, is, a, is amusing. It's kind of psychology, in a way. And, uh, you start with the following question you give to children, and this was used to be in Russia given to, to high school children on the Russian Olympiads. It was an easy question, and it, you, most of you are aware of that. You have six people, a group of six people. Then there are three of them, such that either any three of them mutually acquainted or not too acquainted. Already I made the picture graphically. And then, of course, immediately you formulate it. So given full graph and six vertices, and it's two colored, then contains triangle, which is monochromatic. And proving this is exercise. Any you can easily write computer program pro proving even more general theorem. It's actually a special case of a theorem of Ramsey, which applies to simplices of, of any size. It says we have a simplex of huge size and divided into find too many colors, it always contains monochromatic parts arbitrarily large, even if you color not edges but also faces. And in, in, in this kind of passing from here to the general theorem is obvious. Proving this general theorem any computer program can do, but making this step from people being acquainted not to, to graph, it's obvious if you're a mathematician. And it's just how we do that. Why it's obvious? It's obvious because you know what graphs are. If you don't know, it would be not that obvious. Probably you could invent the concepts of graph, though you wouldn't have the words. 
But that's, I think, psychologically a uh, basic mechanism. It's in our brains, and we don't know what it is. And this, of course, here we face a similar question, but it's not so simple. Yeah? We have this kind of uh, imprecise statement, and there is no doubt in our minds that adequate to this thing in, in graphs. And why we are so certain? Yeah, we can't rigorously justify it, whatever. This step is mathematical, but mathematical a completely different style, uh, completely unknown to us. Yeah, it's so certain, it's so logical, it must be mathematics. But of course, it's not mathematics, you know. OK, so, but now I want to come to proteins. And the proteins are, of course, f famous f problem. Why? Because it's this famous folding problem. But I want to say this again, it's technical problem and full of it just kind of can be precisely formulated, and so people love it exactly because it's precisely formulated, but it's exactly what makes this no, not probably wrong problem. And so again, a good instance of that is what, what Hilbert was writing in his problems. All his problems generally stated are beautiful problems, but whenever he tried to make it precise, it's either trivial or wrong or uninteresting. Yeah? It's incredible how, how it works. Yes. All his problems, yes, if you just what he meant, it was really uh, great. And when he wanted to be precise, it was just nonsense. Almost, I, 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 think, I think half of his question, yeah. Half still OK. But, uh, but they were not uh, the original one. But originally what he stated, half of what he said precisely was just absurd. I mean, either it was uh, I mean, obvious, or it was misplaced, or it was missing the point, et cetera. Right? For example, yeah, this famous example. He wanted to say, develop theory of the function equation. So solving this function equation. This is, Good question. But instead, of, he wanted he want to be precise. He said, let's make an algorithm for solving the function equation. In the moment he said it, there was a solution, was counter example, completely mathematically useless, completely kind of, I mean, kind of ingenious, but having no mathematics to it. And, and that's it. But the first question goes and goes and goes. Yeah, we have the algebraic arithmetic geometry, fantastic field that are actually close to what he was doing along the lines he was doing. In, in, in different contexts. But the question was, or another question, to prove any that you cannot make function many variables superposition of function of few variables. And again, you know, there were, he wanted to be precise, say continuous function. It certainly was a count example. For we found completely immaterial. And the question in general is, what the hell makes function of many variables? What are function of many variables? Why specific function like roots of equations so hard to represent? These are vague questions. However, they stay, and they, they kind of lead, may lead to mathematics which had not been done. This mathematics is still ahead of us. And this, again, or another question I mentioned about discrete groups. By the way, actually, I heard, I don't know whether it's true or not, but my impression that very many people's papers by Hilbert were incorrect. He, he was writing very rigorously, unlike Poincaré, but unlike Poincaré, he was making lots of mistakes. So one is. His solution of warning problem was wrong, and then his solution of Dirichlet problem was wrong. And the, 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 in, in the case of Dirichlet, the correct solution was found by Poincaré ten years prior to him. And, but for some reason, it was his solution was accepted and was corrected, etc. But uh, this, uh, so I, I'm curious, by the way, how much mistake he was making. Yeah, people, when they try to be rigorous and precise, usually start making mistakes. When you keep vague, I mean, like Poincaré, what he was saying is right, but sometimes vague. He was making mistakes, of course. But usually, uh, objection to him, he was not sufficiently precise, but he was saying the right thing. And Hilbert, when he was trying to be precise, would make a mistake. Oh, well, it's natural, yeah, because it's great ideas, no time to make them. Not because he was stupid. I mean, just, it just was a mistake to be precise when you be too, too fast, yeah? yeah. I don't want to be insulting to, 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 to Hilbert, but there is a very good, good joke of that by Pauli, who was saying, I am not objecting to your thinking slowly. But I object to your publishing faster than you think. Yeah, so he was, he was couldn't, had no time to, uh, to think through everything he wanted to, to do. I think so, yeah. Because his, everything in his direction, every, all the ideas were fantastically good. When he was trying to work out details, of course, it takes time, and he was not doing good. So, so this folding problem for proteins is, I think, is, has kind of, some kind of fame attached to it. But it is, I think, is a, not the most interesting problem. Yeah. So it is very technical, and it says 
in general, you have this molecular chain and proteins these molecular chains. There's some interaction between molecules. And then, eventually, it comes to this spatial, make the spatial configuration. And uh, you can try to formalize it and say, how you know interactions, and just you, you want to solve this problem. This equation is tremendously computationally difficult, how to bypass this difficulty. But well, the moment you start doing that, you're already making mistake after mistake after mistake. Because we don't know interaction. It's not like that. They're, they're, not, they're not all fault. And there are lots of misfits. And ta -ta -ta -ta. it's much more complicated and more interesting situation. So once, in, in general, in biology, it's like you, know, you come to the zoo. And, but it's not quite zoo. So this is the whole point. So I'm coming to proteins here. So, so if we start. So, so the difference between zoo animals you see and proteins you see is kind of twofold. First, of course, animals you see by your eyes. In proteins, you don't see, but you read as much you just read about them. And so it's by your mind, eye, you see them. And it's un unclear, so where you gain and what you, what you lose. Because when you see, like animals, you're, you're originally your visual system tricks you in certain perception, which may be right or may be wrong. Right? So you immediately be manipulated by your visual system. So you don't know what you see. Right? Anything you see by your eyes, you don't know what, what you see. Especially with animals. Yeah, you see shapes, which are not there. And Whenever, you have, no matter how much you see, it's, it's very little mathematical there. Yeah? You have to make some effort to forget, in a way, what you saw to become mathematical. And this mathematical way of thinking about animals, I think, is rather recent. Yeah? I think Galileo already had it. I don't know, don't know any indication be before Galileo. He invented this, he, he realized this kind of proportion of different size section of the bone, the size of the bone. And then Buffon also thought about that. This, uh, but it was kind of still r relatively simple, this kind of mathematical thinking about animals. However, if you look at the proteins, you immediately know that it is, it is mathematics. It's mathematical objects of rather a certain type. They match, they, in a way, as diverse as animals in this perception of real things, like you go to the forest or you see different kind of trees. On the other hand, you see that they're made out of mathematical units. But we don't and we understand them, however, as poorly as you understand animals. By the way, again, this idea is interesting enough that in all the times, I think it's like people like Aristotle were very much confused why free thrown stone would move. It was clear to them why animal would move. Animal want to eat, it moves. It was clear. But why stone would move would be unclear. And understanding that we don't understand animals, it's rather recent. At least as the first I read in, in some way in Buffon. He says, oh, well, the hell, this horrible, complicated machine, how could it be? We understand nothing about how it works. And this not understanding was very recent. With proteins, it's good. You just read it immediately, you don't understand anything. It's so good, yeah? It's mathematics. And you don't understand it. And so you want to understand it, yeah? So, one, so what about this folding? So. So what is the logic, the logic of the cell? Yeah? It's really kind of very, very perverted, very converted logic. So this is DNA, which keeps information. This is a keeper of information. And it does nothing, essentially, except just information. But this information makes no sense of information, by the way. What the hell is information? It's not Shannon information. Yeah? It's, it's information, metaphoric information, which has no mathematical definition. It's one of the questions. Is, is there a meaningful mathematical definition of this information? It's systematically used in biology, and it looks kind of metaphorically a good concept, but we don't know what it is. Now, this information is read by some protein. There are some proteins which read this information. And they kind of infinitely more complicated than this DNA. Like, indeed, if you have letters written on the paper, and a reader, a person who goes and reads, I mean, come on, yeah, these letters are no big deal, right? People say DNA is most important anyway. Because these are slave, in a way, people, they are slave of this DNA. However, the proteins are complicated machines. They read it, and among this instruction is 
doing many, many things, but the most kind of interesting is that they can do themselves and they can do a DNA. Right? So among this instruction, how to reproduce this information again and how to make the builds. And of course, such thing could only evolve kind of step by step because you have to start somewhere and nobody has not only idea how it could happen, but why it could happen. Just everything we know about life outside of living matter says this is impossible. Right? So that's this machine of producing, tra transforming information into real objects which move, protein, move, do things, and eventually ourselves. I mean, I mean it's absolutely uh, inconceivable this could happen. And some people believe it only happened because there are so many universes. Because in one universe would be not enough. It's very unlikely. So its probability is so low, you need something like 10 to the 100 universes, then they feel more comfortable. Then maybe one of them is like that. And that may be true. I mean, who knows? <laughs> it may be true. But one day maybe we shall learn. It's at least theoretically. Maybe. It's not impossible. We shall be closer to understanding that. So, but anyway, it is there. So in, in which moment in, in this protein, this information turns into action, right? And this is exactly at the moment of folding. And this is a kind of folding, apart from the physical meaning of that. Of course, it's kind of physical process. But besides being physical, it's also kind of conceptual. I don't know how to call it, to say the information theoretic process. So this information, when it folds, become completely different. Now all inside become more or less irrelevant. Then they keep it. And now the own protein knows what happens on this surface and what it does. Well, not all proteins, of course. Most proteins fall, but not all of them. And tremendous amount of information being lost. And this, I think, is a crucial information being lost. Again, information in what sense? Which means you can change this uh, hugely. The sequence and we have absolutely the same a functional protein. And this happens, you know, in the course of evolution. You have two homologous proteins doing absolutely the same and having almost no common feature on their sequences. In sequence amino acids, there are 20 plus epsilon, yeah? 20 plus 3, yeah? Amino acids, right? 20 plus 3? Different amino acids. Uh, I know 20 plus 1. No, I guess Kunin told me that right in, in another two. <laughs> huh? Yeah, no, 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 no. I, I think there is a form of methionine similar to yes, 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 but this methionine, it is not, it is not an amino acid, a separate amino acid. It is just methionine with uh, selena something, yeah. with selena no, no, um, but, but group attached, but it is methionine modified. Yeah. It is not uh, okay. new amino acid. Okay, this may be the question. And maybe, oh, I, I understand, but it, this too, it is just modified as amino acids. Yeah. It's not new amino acids. Okay, it's not truly new. Okay, but I just you know, I could misunderstand what he said. But he says, uh, and there is some 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 other. I think I'm not certain he said methionine. This came to my mind because he has yeah, sulfur, of course. But it is exactly like this. But one is really seriously additional yeah. amino acids. So. But but anyway, that's. Again, just, we usually we say 20, but everything you say in, in biology, nothing is literally true. Yeah? It's 20 plus epsilon. Yeah. And it's unclear. You see, even the, quest, the, whole, the whole question, what does it mean that there are only 20? If you call it true amenized or modification without amenized. Yeah? So, this, I think, is very, I feel very good with this. Yeah? I mean, because this is a real, real life, and things are not precise, but it doesn't mean they're wrong. Yeah? I mean, again, precision is deadly. I mean, in, 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 this, in, in this context. The idea of precision has its limitation yet. And, but the moment it falls, so it loses tremendous amount of information. And this process is, is transformation of information into, kind of, into action. And, and, and it's very hard to say what, what it is. So when you make all this modeling of Turing machine, ta -ta -ta, there are two aspects of them. Kind of information theoretic and actually something being happening. And they're kind of different, and they're very confusing, of course, in the description of Turing machines and all, all this, which are, of course, not quite mathematics. It's very poor quality mathematics. And the qu one question is, if we're trying to describe cell, you can create more interesting, more beautiful mathematics. So everybody who looked at you know, Turing machine is so ugly. I mean, it's exactly what Hardy said, no room for ugly mathematics. 
However, this mathematic is with us. It is nothing, I think, ugly I can imagine in Turing machines. Idiocy, mathematically. But on the other hand, you, 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 you need it in some, in some sense. Yeah. And the question is if there is something more beautiful. Even more like, ugly, I think, is you know, that von Neumann invented this self reproducing automata. And it's extremely ugly thing. You just describe them and describe them in some kind of a, a, a tremendous bore. On the other hand, it's nice to know it's possible. But what's remarkable again about that, and that's indicator of the in, 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 in imperfection. It's a, it, but that doesn't know how to formulate the theorem. What it means you have self replicating automata. I mean, the, you know, you can describe this process and say how you take this machine, imagine this machine, and it does its, its own copies. But what is the statement of that before you make this uh, description? That's very amusing. That and even in the as if formulated pre precisely the theorem of Turing's universal machine, if you look carefully, they, they're really cheating in how they formulate it. You first make a proof and then adapt your formulation to the proof, to the construction. Right? It's not real mathematics when you have clear cut question and then you answer it. It's, it's not like that. And this was partly it's different kind of mathematics. It has some motivation. But I'm saying that the way cell organizes, the way it replicates, and the way it transforms information is it looks much more beautiful for some reason, logically, than done either by a Neumann model or by a Turing machine, and we have no way to describe it. So we don't have general picture and put them, compare them, and to say this is, has this property and this is property. Right? But for example, there is no simple mathematical model of replication of DNA. I mean, of course, you can describe everything you know, ta 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 ta, but saying it in a simple word, exactly what are features of that, we cannot say. We feel it, it's very sp but it may be, of course, an illusion. Yeah. It may be, of course, an illusion. It looks so very kind of simple and beautiful, but we, mathematical, I mean, not kind of from, from some kind of emotional point of view, beautiful life. So this is one thing about proteins. And so just again, what else we want to say? Just a couple of words about proteins. So how we know by the way they fall, yeah? So what is this folding and what we can do? Yeah, this is two words about ribosomes, if you didn't know, yeah, that's uh, hmm, probably the, 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 the most mysterious thing in the universe, yeah. If you understand least of anything, the ribosome somehow could be involved, of course, every second millions of, trillions of them works in our cells, and we cannot imagine they could come, this machine which make proteins, and, uh, well, the most complicated thing, apparently, the, in the universe, by far more complicated than stars, you know, we understand the explosion of stars billion years, light years away, much better than we understand the ribosome. It's incredible, yeah? And they're all, all in us, we're just making these proteins, and this considered exactly thing which could not happen. Just one universe was not enough. You know, our universe is about diameter, 100 billion light years, is just tiny compared to probability of or improbability of such machine to come to, to life as a ribosome. Right? Absolutely no idea how it could happen. Yeah. Yes. No model, no, just, you, you can add one impossibility upon another. And they, however, they, they work incredibly well. And so they make this protein, and so the logic of that is separation of, yes, on the physical level, this polypeptide chain, there's chemical bonds, which are rather weak bonds, but still there. Uh, chemical bond, they're quite weak. Yeah, in a sense, we have just even green, I think, green photon of light would break, break it. That's another interesting thing, that there is a balance, more or less, between chemical bonds and light of the sun. So if the sun would be a little bit cooler or a little bit hotter, life as we know it would be impossible, right? Because if the photons would be a little bit stronger, they would kill, destroy all chemicals responsible for life. If they would be weaker, they would not create this chemical, right? They, because they're involved in their creation. And as we know, if there is some problem with this ozone layer, then we have the stronger photons coming here, and everything will be dead, yeah? All vegetation, everything will be dead in a matter of days, yeah? Very fast. So it's again incredible that we have this layer, how it could be created, because one day life didn't come with this layer. It was created by biology, yeah? biologically created layer. Oxygen, yeah, was created by, by activity of, of green, of green we don't know of green what, right? Because again, conjecturally, it was not green plants because plants came up afterwards. So it was not even cyanobacteria. So we don't know 
cover the first organism who create uh, oxygen, oxygen producing organisms. They were completely different nature and worked very slowly. And, uh, very, uh, and then with more and more oxygen, and then ozone layer appeared, and then more sophisticated creatures could come in, which would be sensitive to. And probably this first one were not on the surface, because if the ultraviolet were here, no life would be possible on the surface of Earth. They'd be hidden somewhere. Right? So this, everything we see now in life is certainly what's very different from how it began. So you just, can hear just, 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 just general remarks. So these are simple amino acids, how they make. Again, for every shape of amino acid, there is a general scheme, but immediately there are counter examples, yeah? They're all the same except the, without cycle, but one of them has a cycle, the cyclic amino acids. And each of them, of course, has individuality, right? It just, you, if you want to look at proteins, you have to know personally every amino acid. And they each has lots of interesting features. And uh, it's like, if you have a language and you only have 100 words, each word has its personality, right? They're not just words, they're not. And there is a good reason, I think there is a good reason for that. The building blocks, they're very individual, very structured, right? And, uh, and there might be some good logical reason why you don't have kind of very similar and homogeneous blocks, right? On the other hand, for building DNA, you have very homogeneous blocks. For making, making proteins, amino acids on one hand similar, on the other hand extremely different. In many ways they're different, yeah. So if you, the 20 of them, and if you look at by characteristic features, three features and they will be all, all in different groups, right? Right? Almost no two amino acids will be in one group, probably. Right? They, and, and again, it's very hard, it's definitely, it's definitely, it's definitely, mathematicians, this is how they being glued together. It's a process involving water. Everything in biology goes along with water. They come together and one molecule of water goes out. Yeah? And, and when they break, water goes in and they go out. And it's very energetically, almost zero energy level, I think, in both directions. So, but, but it's, there is this hook, yeah? So it's kind of, you can imagine there is hooking, and one chain, and then in, in another like that. And once they're there, they're rather stable. But if you, but it's not energy, it's entropy which keeps them together. And I, I'll come to that in a second. Yeah, that's one interesting issue which should be understood. We, we must be able to Yeah, this is just little information about amino acids. Just to have, this, again, it's specific of this, not that essential. But there is some logic in that, which is, I think, is crucial, which, which is very hard to, very hard to isolate. So you should imagine you have to make artificial life even similar to ours, and they will be these blocks. And they might be separated and structured. For the formal organization must be similar, to, well, vaguely, to what we have here. Not their particular properties, but something. And this something, yeah, when you look at this, it's like learning it, you feel it. But it's very, very hard to uh, articulate, and this is one of the issues. This was kind of rather famous protein because it was the first for which following was kind of postulated or established. And so let, just again, just saying that all proteins have individuality, look, look at this. And this very common uh, protein, it is an enzyme which cut, which cut uh, RNA molecules, and it's used systematically by cows. Now, you know, the cows are how cows function. You know, they cannot digest the food themselves. So they eat this food, and then there are bacteria living there. Actually, this is something I don't quite understand there. But the point, of course, is that as a result, the cell eventually they have to digest are much smaller than the cells of, of vegetables. So vegetable, vegetarian cell can take, contains more, 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 more than just water, a little bit sugar, all kind of sugar there, and very little, say, of, of uh, RNA material. But, but inside of a bacteria, there is lots of RNA. Therefore, in order to digest this bacteria, and cows digest not directly, not directly this vegetable, but they digest our, uh, bacteria, and so they have digest lots of RNA. It's unclear to me. So it means that proportionally this RNA come anywhere from, from plants, the, 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 that concentration of some RNA be getting up. I don't quite understand this, yeah? So why they need it more than we do, right? If we eat meat, I think we have a similar problem. 
But we don't have this RNA, RNAs in our stomach and so on, uh, large quantities, right? Yeah, I mean, when you start thinking about it, you read it, and you see, this, I find it extremely annoying. People say it in books. Immediately you start asking all these questions. How balance being kept? And they never answer it. They, apparently they never ask themselves these questions. It immediately looks really paradoxical. Why cows need more of these uh, uh, RNAs? Could you take out this? This is a so enzyme. In, uh, it drops something. Uh, sound. Something dropped. The, the, the enzyme which cuts, cuts RNA molecule. Yeah? And uh, this was the first about which it was, it was, it, it is very kind of a robust enzyme. Yeah? Well, it, it has some, um, it's built in a very strong way. Usually the attachment between molecules in, 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 in the protein is relatively weak, but there some of those are rather strong, the, the Dyson feedback. And then, it was discovered that if first you uh, do something bad to this protein, you put it, I think, in acid or something, yeah, or heat it, I forgot exactly how you denaturate it, and then it starts working. And it works very well, it can cuts RNA. I, I'm not certain what exactly the test for that. And then it was found by, by uh, I forgot, Affinson, I think, this guy, that um, this was a big discovery, I'm saying, it found each other discovery, it's a work, years and years of work, yeah, that when you cool it back, bring it to the back condition, it comes back to original shape. Namely, at least it becomes as functional as it was before. You see, it's, it's, it's functional. It's a very remarkable thing. What it does, actually, this enzymatic activity of each protein is a kind of a miracle because nothing of, like, of the kind you can do artificially. Like the, the, the enzymatic, and I say again, in, 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 uh, I don't think I have much time. Uh, this is kind of the, the, the catalyzers, extremely efficient catalyzers for certain chemical reactions. Much more efficient than anything, than anything we know. And so this was how it discovered. Okay, maybe I just now say to it, uh, one word about catalysis and that will be the end of it. So they what is catalysis and what enzyme do? And this is a, and again, interesting thing you read in textbooks. And they say something like that. So you have to go from one state to another. No, oh, maybe not a very good picture. You have the profile of energy. And of course, a system would like to go from here to here. But it cannot because there is potentially a barrier. And then there is some catalyzer which kind of cut this barrier, and then you go. And what people don't say, this is just metaphor. It's just, no, well, okay, it's just, it's just the way to have in mind, but this tells you nothing. We don't know the hell what happens. What it means is barrier. You have a space, even in classical terms. First, it's a quantum mechanical process. Forget about that. Even classically, you have system with hundreds of degrees of freedom. Yeah? And so what it means is barrier. So you have this very complicated landscape. What happened there? What it means barrier? How barrier can be made? Barrier where? I mean, what is the probability of making barrier in high dimensional space? You know, it's very, very different in, in one dimension, very easy to make barriers. To make barriers in dimension two, you might have the whole circle of them, yeah, in dimension three, whatever. So what we, enzyme does, enzyme adds degrees of freedom. So you have, we have more high dimensional system. What do you mean it does it? What are the sources he uses for doing that? Protein, as enzyme, internally has very little energy in, inside. It's a very weak thing. It breaks. Covalent bonds are very strong. How could it be? I mean, so none of this is actually well. Something is known, but essentially it's unknown. And when, when you read the book, people pretend that they understand. That's I found extremely annoying. When you read the book in biology, you read it as if people know what to talk about. It's just like, uh, you know, just they say kind of one incredible thing after another in a, in a matter of fact way, yeah. which, is, uh, which is extremely, extremely annoying. Because you know, something is known, something is unknown, and some people know it, some don't. It's a huge field, of course, and very few people understand enzymatic activity and have different perspectives on that. Mathematically, is what are the shape of this, of this landscape, and how the shape being changed by introducing new, new, new uh, substances? So, what are the yeah, mathematics of that? The most primitive description. I say one word. I thought a little bit. It's extremely primitive. It doesn't tell you the whole story, but 
it is of the following kind. That one way to describe the you know, immense kind of, kind of possible specialization, I have no time to, to go into that, of this question, both of folding the somewhat related and enzymatic activity. Yeah? And there are, I guess I thought a little bit what mathematics can be account, account for that. Not proving, of course, anything about a specific enzyme, but at least giving a background. Of course, you have to know things also. Yeah? Things ha happen in a variety of ways. But even this naive picture which I described may have purely mathematical development. Yeah, if you just look more realistically, high dimensional space, how to make sense of that, it's not so easy. But one thing which is mildly amusing, which describes some of those systems as follows. That you can describe proteins in the other system like that as trees with measures on them. So trees have lengths of edges. And so there is some distinguished point here. So distance to this point represents energy. And there is thickness of these edges. It's kind of entropy of them. So these are the objects. And the simplest one of them will be just measure on the line. But the whole tree is a line, it will be just measure. And this classical physics, statistical mechanics is concerned with. You have a physical system, and you, what you look, you see how entropy is distributed with respect to energy. How many states are there with given energy? And this was statistical mechanics when this tree reduces to line. And then various operations of measures make sense for trees. For example, convolution of measures makes sense for trees. And when you bring new particle, meaning you take convolve your tree with somebody else. Trees is only background of what happens to the protein, not the whole story. But it's still already informative and it's mathematically transparent. Yeah? But well, I have no time to talk about that. And actually, even if I had, I have pretty, 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 pretty little to say, except that some f formalism of measures extends to the trees, and they make kind of a nice category. But say, enzymes are quite quite mysterious. Both they are not understood physically, chemically, biologically, neither mathematically. We just don't know even how to start talking about them in context of classical mathematics. Of course, they some process are, are they of course quantum. So, Excuse me, can you can you repeat again about the trees? Who, what is edges and what is the vertex? So again, just when you have a physical system, you can consider this function of energy and see how much particles, how much voice, phase, phase volume is in a, in a given region of energy. And this is kind of the basic kind of usually take Laplace transform of that with canonical distribution, but this kind of technicalities. That's what statistical mechanics is about. Right? You describe physical system by a measure on the line. And the measure says you how much, how many stuff has given energy. But when you look at a more complicated system like that, it may happen that there are several states which may go from one to another with the same energy. So you have a tree, and you have energy, and you have two branches with the same energy, and they have a like different weight. And then there are extra structures there, how fast you go from one branch to another. So the system are, 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 are multi-stated. There is no unique equilibrium state for this system like proteins. Proteins, or even more when you have system of several proteins. There is no unique, in a, again, state here is a measure. You see, state, not just point. It's a measure, and again, it's questionable language. Yeah, the whole of this language of statistical mechanics is very, very deceptive when it comes to it. It's not, uh, not adequate. But this kind of tree is part of the reality of certain biological systems. So they describe these kind of trees, which, is, uh, which it says how many possibilities are per given energy. And, we, 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 and uh, so it is partly catches the idea of connectivity of the space. Let me give a very simple example, simple remark where it's motivated by if you have a function on the space, on the Euclidean space, there is this tree of levels. You consider, you consider these levels and they connect the components of levels. You have a tree, I think it was introduced by Cronrod. So it is a topological tree. And statistical mechanics has measure theoretic projection. So if you combine the two things, you have a Cronrod tree and it also has a measure how much in there. So there are different connected components in the space of states. Of course, if they're very close, they mix up. If not, they're not. So this tree is not the end of the story. But it's already may, may have some meaning in, in, in proteins. And there is little mathematics behind them. Even if, for example, you multiply two trees, and then you and say this energy, and so you have a tree again. So this convolution 
on, on these trees. But of course, when you introduce an enzyme, it's more tricky. It's trickier thing than convolution. So it distorts the tree. And then, well, I thought a little bit you can say something uh, about, uh, about that, what it means, it means um, to, to have a quasi, quasi convolution, which corresponds to, to enzyme. But again, this is just mathematical, very naive things, which we which, which, which don't want to reflect the whole picture as usual. It's like a description of this erythrocytic solution of variational equation. They only touch the simplest part of what happens. And then there are layer after layer after layer, but all of them may, may be mathematically, not all of them, but some of them may be mathematically significant. Okay, so I'll stop here. Yeah, it's time. I mean, I was asking questions, now you may ask questions. This whole, this whole question about biology. Yeah. Uh, so the folding, the way the protein folds is the only thing that matters for, for biology, or other things also matter? Or how this protein behaves? Is the, the folding the only important thing about it? No, not all protein fold. They, uh, the, the, in, in the folded state, it becomes active if it folds. Yeah, but it's um, somehow it misfold, and it's equally important because if they misfold, you die if you misfold too many. So cells have to keep track of the protein which misfold, for example. So misfolding is, uh, uh, say, as uh, you know, important. I mean, what mean important? Uh, what is more important? What is more important for bread or, 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 or potassium cyanide? No, I mean, I mean, exactly. What will have more effect on you? Huh? I mean, well, answer me this question. If you speak about importance, what is more important for you, bread or potassium cyanide? Or what? Potassium cyanide. Potassium cyanide. Uh, yeah. Which is more important? What do you Yeah, so, so but, but you wouldn't eat it, yeah? So important doesn't mean good. Well, there are many important no, things, no, but no, they no, use. What I mean is different. What I mean is different. You have two different proteins that fold exactly the same pattern. Yeah. When they fold the same, do they behave the same? Yeah, they behave more or less the same. Oh. Not only fold, but they well, are the other features. It's not only the shape of the folding. There are those uh, molecules which will be on the surface of proteins. How strongly it will be fold, how flexible it will be. There are lots of parameters. But still, the number of parameters is much fewer than the number of in in ingredients. You see, therefore, you can change protein and having parameters the same, and it will work the same to two proteins. Again, I must be very careful in saying that, because they do the same thing, but in different environments, in different organisms. This is what we observe, right? So you must be somewhat careful if it's the same, right? It's a, it's, there is a wheel in the bicycle, and there is a wheel in the car. If their shape are important, it's the same. You can't replace one by another. But what's important, they're both wheels, right? So, I mean, this might be quite, you know, it's very dangerous to make simplistic conclusion. But again, the sameness, by the way, is already mathematically non trivial issue. What does it mean they're the same? Yeah? The same, there is a context, and context is so variable, yeah, unlike physics. There's so many, many contexts. And then uh, this depends on context. But this, by the way, about potassium cyanide is again a mathematically very interesting question. You can eat lots of stuff and everything happens to you. You digest them and then like tiny little stuff and you have problem. So in what sense you are stable? What a mathematical description of stability of dynamical system, which is stable in some range and then highly unstable in different range. Right? Now in France actually there is a lot of poisoning by mushrooms, yeah? And I forgot the most efficient, I forgot I don't know what, what the English name for that, the most efficient kind of poisons which stop your, block your RNA, RNA synthesis. Bledne paganke. How could, could, could be in, in, in English? How, what, how called this chemical in them, which stops, stops uh, RNA synthesis? Uh, I mean not, I mean I eat something like that. They have very, very efficient po cellular poison. Okay. I mean, it's very interesting, you know, the way you're being poisoned by these kind of mushrooms, they disrupt your production of RNA. Okay, okay. You guys have to remember.